So tonight we're going to be talking about how to plan a backcountry tour. Really, uh, my name is Greg Schaffer. On behalf of everybody on Mountain Rescue, we're really welcome to honor you to our building. Thank you for taking your time out of your night to come learn more with us. We've got a series of speakers here who will all talk about a different element of coming together and planning a backcountry tour. You're going to notice a bunch of these QR codes I've got stashed throughout my presentation here. If you were to just point your phone at this, all of you millennials, hop on out, pull out your iPhone. This is an interactive presentation. If you just point at this screen, you don't even need an app or anything. You can help the boomer next to you figure it out on their phone. And what's going to happen is a little link will pop up, and we want to hear feedback. I want to know, how does this event work for you? What did you learn? What do you want to learn more about? How could this be better? Right? We want to keep doing events, and we need more ideas. At the bottom of that feedback form will be a link to take you to sign up for our email list. And that's basically how we notify people when we open registration for those types of events that do have limited capacity. So really, right? if any of you guys were like watching, read the poster, and came here because you saw the ad, it said that I was going to talk about navigation. It's a little bit of a bait and switch. Right? I'm certainly going to talk a little bit about navigation, but I mostly want to talk about how to navigate you to learn more and to find more classes and more opportunities to continue your own mountain safety education. Your best opportunity coming up right now, and yes, I am biased, because I've put a lot of work into organizing it, but I think it's going to be a great event. January 18th, we have our winter workshop. It's our 36th annual event. It's a full day of hands-on skills training. Essentially, here at Mountain Rescue, what we try to do is we do four events a year. We want to do two events where we do hands-on skills training. We want to teach you how to do something. And then we'll do another two events, like tonight, where it's just different, they're thematic, they change every time, and it's kind of gets you start thinking about different ideas, different topics in the world of mountain safety. And they'll always be different, right? So it's kind of that constant kind of soft skills versus hard skills. So again, you can sign up. We've got a QR code right there. It'll take you right into the registration. And in fact, we've got prizes for the first, fifth, and tenth person to sign up tonight for the winter workshop. Just kind of like a radio show, right? And then we got another event, right? We're going to have an event. We do a summer workshop where we get together and we talk about all of these skills you might want to hear more about. I'll talk a little bit about navigation tonight and a little bit framing the discussion about where we're going to go skiing. But you might want to learn a lot more about how to do navigation, right? I know there was another event going on tonight all about Caltopo. Maybe if some of you wanted to go to that, it's a really great tool. I'll certainly be talking about that. But that's a deep dive to go into those kind of tools. And so what we did over the summer is we took this kind of standard industry pack list, the 10 essentials, we broke that into four different tracks where you go and you sign up, and you can pick whatever class you want. You can mix and match. This is kind of how the registration broke out last year. You can see this navigation track sold out quickly. So sign up for that email list. That QR code will take you to our email list, and you'll get notified as soon as I open registration, and you can come on and pick your classes. When I went back and looked at it, I noticed not many people are signing up for self-care. All right, so our event in the spring is going to be about self-care. Details are still to be announced. We're still working out those logistics, but we'll have another event. We have our January workshop. Can I mention the January workshop? So that's coming January 18th. And then we'll also be having the event March, April, depending on some logistics. And then uh, we'll do our summer workshop in June. So we're here. We want to talk about backcountry. It's enough sales. Thank you for coming to our events. Keep coming back. So tonight, we're going to talk about how do we go backcountry skiing. And so I called up four of my friends who I like to go ski touring with, and we're going to go for a ski tour. I've got a few ideas. I've got a few options of places we can go. And I'll kind of run through a little bit of how I might look at a route and start talking about where I want to go. But at the end of the day, navigation, I think, is one of those hard skills that you can get good at and become proficient at. But there's going to be all these other topics that are always changing and we're always continuing to learn about, right? How do we manage our, each other in our groups? Debbie will tell us about all kind of rescue gear and things we need to carry for that. Rich Berkeley will talk to us about some of the local special, unique characteristics of backcountry skiing here in the, in the Roaring Fork Valley. Brian Lazar, the deputy director of CAIC, will come and talk about avalanches and conditions, right? We'll chat a little bit about what's appropriate, what's a good ski tour for us to be doing right now. How are the conditions out there? And then we'll wrap it up. Michael Kennedy will talk to us a little bit about how do we make decisions. 
that human factor, risk management. How do we deal with each other as people out there in the backcountry? So as I'm going ski touring, right, I might go and I can, this is a map of Caltopo, and I can start throwing some lines up on the map. Some of you might recognize this area right outside of Highlands Bowl. You know, we went on this great ski tour last year out to Five Fingers. It was really awesome. I don't really know if it's going to be a great idea for this weekend, but Highlands is opening, so we'll chat about it. I got a few other ideas, but you can see I can head over here on Caltopo and I can throw on these different layers. What I'm looking at is slope angle shading. And what that does is it goes on and it takes those contour lines and it uses this legend to show me how steep that slope is. And I can go ahead and I can throw either a contour line here, you looked at it originally, there's a topo map, then I can throw a satellite layer instead and still have that slope angle shading on it. I can do things like, I can go on to Caltopo and I can now designate and I want to tell it, show me slopes that are 30 to 45 degrees, also known as avalanche terrain, that are north through east facing and make them red, right? It can be a really way, I can spend a lot of time going through, looking at these online resources and starting to familiarize myself with the terrain. I can export that, throw it into Google Earth and kind of spin around and start looking at my route from different angles and different perspectives. I can throw those same overlays into Google Earth. And I can be looking at a route, I can be looking at slope angle shading, I can be looking at topo. Here's an image where I'm able to pull down a satellite image that was taken in the past week and I put contour lines on top of it and then I threw that same north through east facing slopes that are 30 to 45 degrees, make them red, and I can spend a lot of time, I can do a lot of planning. I can get elevation profiles. I can go really deep and really kind of analyze my route and my terrain and where I'm going and what I'm doing. But what's really important to keep in mind, all these tools are great resources for me to navigate. Sometimes there's this element where we're out there making decisions where it's, is more information going to help me make a better decision? Or should I be simplifying my decision? We'll be hearing more about that. But when we're talking about navigation, right, there's going to be some time I'm going to spend ahead of time where I research my route, I think about where I'm going, I can print out maps, I can have a compass, I'll have these really reliable tools that I'll carry with me, and I'll use those while I'm in the backcountry to navigate. It's the modern age. There's a ton of great digital resources out there, and I think I'd be foolish not to use those. At the same time, I can take those same resources and I can throw them into my phone here, and I can have all that same information that I've spent time researching at home and sitting at home and looking at these different routes and contemplating options and have that with me out in the backcountry. I think navigation is something that you can be good at. However, at the same time, we might not be asking the right questions if all we're thinking about is navigation. Right? I want to draw attention to an accident that happened last year in January. It was during an avalanche class. It was an advanced level two avalanche class and there was a fatality. And if you go into it, right, it's called the Upper Center of Beck Basin. I really encourage you to read it. Brian will probably show us where you can find these accident reports. But they highlight the use of using these types of tools to make your decisions and basing them solely off that. They specifically call out this idea that these resources are great but the difference between a representation, representation of the terrain and the actual terrain is really important. So we're going to go out, we're going to do research, we're going to look at maps, we're going to use these tools, but that's not the only way we're going to make decisions. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring together this group, so we can talk about all the other elements that come into place. It doesn't matter where we go. We still need to talk about a couple of these things. So one thing I want to highlight, I think one of the reasons it's important that we have Rich Berkeley and I really appreciate having that voice in the room, is this is a statistic, a statistic a lot of you might not have seen or recognize or understand, right? Credit goes to Blaze Reardon. He put this together in a research project a couple years ago while he was working for CAIC. And I talked to a lot of people who talk to me about side country and slack country and they like to go out there because they feel like it's a lot safer. And we've all gone out there and we see these gates, we see these signs, we kind of go right past and we don't think a lot about it. Right? It's like that sign's pretty clear. The language is, is pretty obvious, what your decision, are, decision is. But I think if you kind of realize that in our local area, where most people are going out and getting in trouble, is from the ski area. They're leaving the ski area, they're heading out into the backcountry, they're going skiing, and we're seeing a lot of accidents there. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about why that could happen. What are some of the thoughts and decisions that go into that? Any questions before we get diving in? Last chance, sign up for the Avalanche Workshop. <laughs> First, fifth, and tenth person will win a prize to be announced at the end. Also, we have prizes coming for, from Corbeau at the end, and then we're gonna have a grand raffle prize. You have to sign up and get a raffle ticket from the Ute table back there in the left back. Great, any questions? Yeah. So the question was about a particular app, it's called Gaia, and using slope angle shading, and yes. There are a variety of apps, there's a lot of resources, um, and that's why I'd encourage you to come to our summer workshop. You can spend a full day where we just do a very deep dive into navigation, and there are a tremendous amount of tools, and I don't wanna be pitching or advocating for any one particular tool, because it's really gonna depend on the use case. Great. All right, next up we'll talk from, uh, we'll hear from Rich Berkeley. Greg, thank you. I'm gonna break mine down into two components. I'm gonna cover inbounds, uphilling first, and then I'll cover backcountry skiing. So um, we are f fairly lucky, and I'll thank Katie Ertle, who's in this room somewhere, and she's the current VP of Mountain Operations for Aspen Skiing Company, that we have a very liberal and open uphill policy. And so preseason, which is currently just about to end as of uh, Saturday, um, at night, and then postseason, and then during operating hours, pretty much you have access to some uphill, okay? And that is fairly unique in the industry. That's one of the things we want to talk about. Um, for unfettered uphill, I think there's only about 10% of the ski areas that offer it. 58% don't allow it at all, and the rest do some kind of hybrid. So if you went over to Vail or Steamboat, you've got a fairly narrow designated route. Sunlight now is charging with an armband and these kinds of things. So, so far, we have been able to, I call it get away with, um, allowing people to go up our mountains all year that we have snow. And then of course in summer we allow hiking. So to preserve that is what my goal is. And there's a couple of areas where we have safety issues that I'm very confident that everyone in this room follows, but making sure that the whole community does that. If we have one incident, um, and I will give you a couple of things that we've had some narrow misses, um, the first people that are gonna come in is not the lawyers, it's the insurance companies. And so those are the ones that I'm afraid of the most. And they have no concept of what uphill is. The second group will be lawyers, and the third group will be ski area management. So preserving our privilege is what we were talking about. Oh, I'm sorry, I've got a lawyer here. <laughs> so you're not number two. <laughs> our general counsel, David Clark. Um, so uh, keeping that in mind as a force for, for good. So, what are the dangers? From my perspective, the, the biggest danger is, if you're going uphill, is equipment. Snowmaking, cats, and snowmobiles. And so if you see any of those three, a huge avoidance is, is the best re, um, requirement. When we were doing a winch cat, we did winching uh, uh, two days ago on Highlands, and I was watching the uphill group, all locals, and in fact, some of them in this room, and there's probably eight or 10 of them going up, and they saw the winch cat, and they all switched course and went up uh, Red Onion, which was exactly what I was like. I couldn't have scripted a better local knowledge. And they see the winch cat going up Prospector, and they all shifted. On Aspen Mountain, when we're winching, which was about uh, right before we opened, two days before we opened, we start moving those whales of, of artificial snow, and huge chunks of ice will break off three or 400 pounds and roll down. So you can be down in spar, and we're moving a, a whale up at chair three, and, a, and 500 yards later, that chunk of ice is coming down, and it's moving, and if, you, if it hits you, that's a problem. That's why we close the mountain for those times. We always give you an al alternative, though. So at that time, we gave you both tie hack and um, uh, Highlands were skiing really well, and then Snowmass, of course, was uh, open for operation. So that's number one. And then number two is respecting the employees. And so when we're out there, so if you're going up buttermilk tonight, or we have a full moon next week, um, the cat operators are gonna be out there. And so staying clear of their passes and letting them do their job, don't do the, uh, we call it the Tiananmen, where you walk right in front of the, the um, snow cat, and don't move. <laughs> and we're like, come on, so. And then the third, so if those two things, if you can encourage locals, and I'm not worried about anyone in this room, I, I look at this group and this is a fairly dialed group, I see Tyler every morning on Aspen Mountain, um, it's the rest of the community. We wanna just uh, be able to share this with our guests and then the people that are not local to the area. Um, and then the third, and only applies to guys, and this is my personal pet peeve, is please don't pee in the uptrack. 
And so just take five minutes, go into the trees, and just do someplace where it's not going to be skied over or last all year. Okay, and that, this one, already this year, I'm like, come on, can't you guys make it uh, 30 minutes of the buttermilk without peeing in the uptrack? So that's um, inbounds uphilling. So now we go to the boundary policy. And so another unique thing that we have, um, in addition to allowing inbounds uphilling, is we maintain an open boundary. So we don't say it very often because there is some risk to that, and that fatality chart is one of them. But you can leave anywhere in our resort with the exception of two places. The two places are the Minx litigation area at the bottom of Burnt Mountain. That's a closed area, and that's a Forest Service closure, and so that is closed boundary. And the uh, second one is the Loge boundary on Highlands Peak. Even though it's a boundary and it says the ski area signs, um, that is actually part of the ski area permit on the other side of that, and we have that closed as well. We have plenty of places that are still outside of our operational boundary, within our permit boundary, that are open. So a lot of Burnt Mountain is that way too. You know, it used to be that way. You could ski Burnt before there. So open boundary, and that is a responsibility then. If you're choosing to leave the ski area under the rope, that is, becomes your responsibility immediately. Greg referenced side country. We don't call it that, and neither does the Forest Service, and neither does the Sheriff's Office. You leave the rope. They're, they're clearly marked with signs and ropes for the most part throughout the whole boundary. Um, you're on your own. You're responsible for your own safety. You're responsible for know, know where you're going. You're responsible for everything we're going to cover in the rest of this presentation. So that's unique. And for most ski areas, in fact, I, um, David Clark, do you know of any that have open boundary? I, I can't think of one except when you go to Europe. So we have actually had this for a while. The Forest Service and Aspen Skiing Company have then created, we call them access points, and those are the gates. Can we go back to that, Greg, the gate? Um, and so we have 36 gates across the four mountains, and they are where you want to ski. So if you're jumping a rope, like let's say you wanted to ski Kino, not the best skiing, not the best egress, and you can't trespass over private land when you leave the ski area, we don't have one there. But everywhere else we do. And so they're marked like this, and the Forest Service sign is on the left, and no one ever read it. It's got all the verbiage, it's three paragraphs. And then a couple years ago, you know, actually 25 years ago, we came up with the, um, the red sign, which is a little bit more simple, and our international guests understand it, because it has a skull and crossbones. That then became the most popular thing to steal, um, but, and people still ignore it, but at least it's simpler than it was before. If you leave through the gates, then at least you have a portal on access. One of the things that I'm concerned about is if you leave under a rope, um, which you're always trained never to jump ropes, and someone follows you that doesn't have the skills or knowledge that you have, that is the big fear that we have. And that used to happen quite a bit in Burnt Mountain before it became part of the ski area. So those are the two things. When you leave the ski area, rescue and recovery is through the sheriff's office and then through this ulti organization ultimately. So the ski area has no um, responsibilities for safety outside of the, the operational boundary. So if you are in trouble, the call will go through the sheriff's office. Often the sheriff's office will call patrol because we're first responders. Or if we know something's going on, we will call the sheriff's office and ask if we can get permission from the sheriff's office to go out of bounds. So un under the ropes or beyond the signs, and I think I, have inclu I didn't include a sign on this one. Sorry, I get, I've got a different one. Um, the, we, the ski patrol is not responsible. But also, for a lot of you, the ski, you're not, when you're leaving the ski area, it's not in operation. So if you were to leave right now, Outside, we don't have medical um, or rescue on, on the mountains, okay? It won't, they won't be there on two of the mountains until 7 o'clock tomorrow morning, and then two of the, the mountains are still raw right now, so you go ski the sugar bowls, and the call is going to be to the sheriff's office. So those are the things that you have to be responsible for when you're leaving. Um, for most backcountry trips, of course, Greg picks the most dangerous one out there. It's the Highland Bowl departure along the Five Trees Ridge to that. I definitely know what you're doing if you're going to do that, but we do have tons of great skiing that's really easily accessible, and you can take your little kids in there, sugar bowls of buttermilk being the easiest one to, to think about. Um, so I hope that clar clarifies it. The other thing that you cannot do, the last thing I want to talk about, is re-entering the area in a closed area. You are welcome to re-enter the area anywhere you want, and you're in the backcountry, with the exception of two, and that is the ship's prow and snow mass. So at the bottom of the wall, the right-hand side there, um, and then the second one is on um, Pandora's or when we're doing snow control work. Um, so if you're coming in from Pandora's to Walsh's and we are doing avalanche control, 
that is closed. And it's your responsibility to know that we're doing it. You should know those days, although those are the days that you're going to want to be back there. Um, we've had two incidents in, in the last 15 or 20 years, God, I'm getting old, um, where we have set charges and actually have moving snow and people are on Lud's Lane and we didn't know it. So we, uh, you know, we have road guards everywhere, but it's still, they get by you and then suddenly that can be a real problem. And that would be very, very bad for our legal team and for the operation. We'd have to certainly curtail it. Can I answer any questions on either inbounds uphill or on uh, boundary policy? If not, then I will turn it over to Debbie Kelly. Where are you, Debbie? All right, you guys. I'm going to talk a little bit about if you're planning a, a backcountry trip, just kind of some of uh, some things you might want to think about as far as how to survive, you know, how to, what, when, what happens when something goes wrong. And if you have a group of people, you don't have to carry that much more stuff to make it so that, um, so that you can um, survive out there. Has everyone heard of the uh, four threes of survival? So it's three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, three days without water and, or, uh, three days without water and uh, three weeks without food. All right, so probably for us, um, the biggest thing air-wise for us is probably an avalanche. Um, we don't have a lot of lakes uh, that we're worried about, you know, drowning, that kind of stuff. But, you know, definitely with, um, with avalanches, we need to get the person out as quick as possible and get them with air. So if you're traveling anywhere in the backcountry where there's avalanche danger, you need to have the three essential things, at least an uh, avalanche transceiver, um, a shovel, and a probe, all right? And you need to know how to use those things. So I'm not gonna go into a lot into that stuff. That's just kind of the air part of that. The next thing is the uh, shelter. Three hours without uh, shelter when the conditions are, are uh, bad out there, when it's cold and windy and stuff, how are you gonna keep yourself warm or if someone's injured or, or for some reason they've lost enough energy, they can't get going. So shelter-wise, there's a lot of different little things you can do that just make you a whole lot more comfortable. One is getting yourself off the snow. Just a, um, you know, a really lightweight insulate pad of some kind, and they make some really small ones. This one's kind of medium-sized, but that'll really help, or even just sitting on your pack, uh, putting all your clothes on, using your pack under your butt, that'll really, you know, keep the snow from making you really cold. Um, a few other things. Um, here's just a, this little uh, bivy sack, you know, really small, really lightweight. It kind of doubles, It'll, you can wear it as a poncho, you can get in it as a bivy sack, you could use it as a tarp, it's kind of multi-purpose. Um, think about maybe if you're out there above tree line and you can't really get in under trees and stuff, you're kind of exposed and you need to get out of the wind, just digging a trench and um, you know, using some kind of tarp to cover to cover the uh, the top of the trench, you know, just just to get yourself out. Because generally, in an emergency situation, you're not going to have the time to build a full snow shelter. That just takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy to build a snow shelter. So um, think about just having enough stuff so you could cover yourself up, get yourself warm, get yourself off the snow. So that's kind of the the uh, shelter end of it, and then. Um, the, the, you know, three days without water and stuff, there's always, in the winter time, we have plenty of water. It's just, how do we melt it? Um, and so one of my favorite ways of finding, when I don't have um, enough water, if I'm out on a day trip even, or um, going to a hut and it's, a, you know, taking a lot longer, I always take a little thermos of hot tea or hot whatever you want. If it's warm enough, well, one, it'll help get you warm if you're cold. The other thing is, if it's a warm day or you're needing more water and you still got hot uh, liquid, you can just put snow in it. And then you can fill this back up and all of a sudden you've got twice as much fluid with you as when you started, if you just kind of keep putting snow in there. So, um, so that, that's always something I always have in the backcountry. Um, 
Another good thing, it's just a big plastic bag, big, big trash bag. Um, it's waterproof. It, you can uh, make a, a coat out of it by cutting a hole for your arms and your, and your head. Um, and if you had to spend the night out, maybe put your legs inside your pack, put all the clothes you have on, use any other gear you have to kind of, you know, use it as insulation, anything you can think of. You know, you can use a bag of food to just kind of um, in, in your backpack to help keep your legs warm. So there's a lot of ways you can do it without um, carrying a lot of weight because obviously we want to get out there, we want to have fun. We don't want to weigh ourselves down. So just some really lightweight things to, to have. Um, then, so I'm not, I'm not gonna go into food, but it's obviously whenever you're in the backcountry, take enough food to sustain yourself. Take some high energy food, some, some bars, some nuts, um, you know, jerky, just anything that's kind of high calorie. Think about, you know, whenever you're out there and you need uh, some calories, you know, have stuff that you can easily eat, not stuff that you have to cook. And especially if you're going on a hut trip and you know you're going to get to the hut and you're going to cook all this great food, think about what happens when you don't get to the hut. Because having food will help you keep you warm. You know, being able to eat and have enough uh, food and water will help you stay warm too. So if you end up, you know, not being able to find the hut, it gets dark and, you know, it happens. All, all these things have happened. Um, Another big part of an emergency response is communication. And so um, it's important to, if you leave by yourself, is to tell someone where you're going, where you plan to travel. Um, and it's really best to travel with at least one partner, all right? So always have someone with you. The other thing is keeping communication between you and your partners. So I know that everyone travels at different rates and a lot of people get out and get way ahead of their um, partners and sometimes that's just not, um, not a great idea because you can't communicate. So if you're gonna spread way out and you agree to do that, maybe have those uh, little walkie-talkie radios, you know, so you can talk to each other. And it's like, hey, you know, we're having problems back here. Can you come back and help us? So communication is really important um, within your group. And then communicating with the outside world in case something does happen. And the evacuation or whatever needs to happen is beyond your ability. So there's all kinds of great communication these days. Um, we have cell phones, but they don't really work that well in the back country. However, you find with cell phones uh, around here in the back country, sometimes going uphill, gaining a ridge, if there's a ridge nearby, might buy you a little bit of service. We are so lucky in this community, we have 911 texting. So if you only have one bar, you can text 911, all right? So that's really a, a really nice thing to have because a lot of times we're out there and we only have one bar, you know? So keep that in mind that um, 911 texting is available here and I, I know it's spreading throughout the country, but we do have it here in Picking County. Um, there's a lot of new satellite communication devices out. Um, th this is an, an older model of a spot um, messenger device. This has a nine, or kind of an emergency button, um, so you can push it. It goes to a dispatch center down in Florida or Texas or somewhere, and they then look at where you are. They have uh, latitude and longitude of where you are, and they look and see what county you're in. They call the county sheriff and say, hey, we've got an emergency locator uh, going off at this location. And then the sheriff calls Mountain Rescue, and then we respond. Um, the only problem with these, these older models, is that's all we know. So Mountain Rescue gets um, a page from the sheriff saying, yeah, there's an emergency there. Well, we have no idea what the emergency is, you know, how many people are there, if it's a medical, if it's, you know, just an avalanche, nothing. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's a little diff difficult for us. We end up having to kind of respond with everything, including the kitchen sink, because we don't know what we have. Um, uh, newer devices, and actually now Spot has a newer device that uh, allows for two-way texting. So the inReach came out, and that's uh, and this is allows two-way texting. So um, and these devices aren't cheap. They're a, you know a few 
two, three, four hundred dollars, and they, a lot of them come with a service plan. You can get the emergency service plan. It's like twelve dollars a month. It's pretty cheap, and it just allows you to have enough communication, um, so you could get like ten text messages out. But if you had an emergency and you ended up going over your text data and you spend it, spent 40 or 50 or $60 communicating, that would be totally worth it, right? So that's what I do. I just keep the emergency plan on, on my inReach. They now make a nice little bitty one called the Mini. It's really light, you know, and so it, you can't say, well, I just don't want to carry more gear because now it's so small that that's not an excuse. Um, all right. so. More about what to do when things go wrong. So with your group gear, you should have pretty good first aid with you, all right? So small little personal med kit. Um, Mountain Rescue has these. We, we sell them. And if everyone in the group had one, you could probably take care of a pretty good um, emergency, medical emergency. Something to splint with. We can always use... You can always use your poles. Poles make a great splint if you're out traveling with poles. Sam splint, this is kind of your all-purpose splint that does a little bit of everything. It rolls out. If you turn it this way, it gets really stiff. You can use it for an arm splint. You could use it for um, a leg splint. You could you know, keep someone's knee immobilized. It's really good with ankles, wrists, anything like, like that. So also, you can make a C-collar out of this. Um, so just, you know, quick little split, something like this, really lightweight, easy to use. Um, and then one thing, if you're doing a big expedition, you might want to have some way to evacuate someone. So they make these um, little sleds that I put, I put one together here. Comes in this bag. That's how small it is. It's basically the two, pole, the two uh, tubes on either side of my skis and then this um, canvas top. I'm, I'm going to tip it up so you can kind of see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you need to, um, yeah, so this is a, a, a really easy sled, you know, so you could at least haul someone maybe just to a, a helicopter landing so you could have an evacuation with a helicopter. Um, you know, Flight for Life can easily come and pick people up in the backcountry without Mountain Rescue's involvement. However, we oftentimes will call them when we see what we have. So, lay it back down. So this just uses um, my skis, my poles, and the kit. And that's really all that's necessary. It does help to have an insulite pad or some kind of padding, but you can always use extra clothing. All right, so just one way, if you're doing a big expedition and you've got a big group of people, you know, one person has to carry this. It's, it weighs literally less than two pounds. Um, all right, so. The other thing is you can use uh, the insulite pad. That makes a good, you can use that as a, um, a splint. Uh, a lot of packs, you can pull the stiffener out of the back of your pack. And that would make a, a really good uh, splint too. So look around at what you have in your pack and how your pack's designed. You might find um, more things there. Um, all right. The other thing I always carry in the winter is a big old down coat. Um, you know, they're light, they wad up to just about nothing, right? And you can get so much warmth out of it. So you end up having to spend the night um, overnight and you've got a down coat on your, the upper part of your body, then you know, the, the, you can stay pretty warm. So always have a, a nice insulating layer when you go out, especially if you're going out overnight or even if you're going to a hut, don't always depend that you're going to get to the hut. I have spent a lot of time in huts and over the years read a lot of log books in the huts and it's amazing the stories you read, the disasters of people not making it to the hut. So think about, you know, preparing yourself for not making it to the hut. 
and I will say kind of one of the, probably the um, recurring theme of not making it to the hut is people taking too much stuff. All right, so look at your pack, look, look at what you're bringing, and try to bring things that really count, that you really need, and not so much of all that extra stuff. You don't need a clean, a clean shirt for every day. You don't need, you know, a change of long underwear. You just, just wear the same thing for the three, four days you're out there. Everyone else is gonna do the same. All right. Um, so um, the other thing that I think is um, just one more thing that's really important to take is kind of preparing for what happens if your equipment breaks? Because it's, it really is a bummer when your boots break or your binding breaks and you can't get, a, get around, you know? So my favorite um, things to have in my emergency repair uh, kit are a fair amount of duct tape and you can tape it around your water bottle or whatever else you want to tape it around. Um, some uh, light wire, you know, just a a little spool of some some kind of wire that's not real heavy that can really help hold things together and then extra ski straps and these ski straps that are um, that are part of this kit these these orange orange ski straps throw three or four of them and I mean they're great for just tying things to, on your pack tying things together repairing things um, you know the other thing is look at your bindings and see what kind of parts might fall off it never hurts to have an extra binding screw and some steel wool, some, some glue, just, you know, a few things that would really help make your trip better if something went wrong. And also check, check your uh, ski equipment and your bindings and stuff before you leave. Just, you know, give everything a little twist and say, okay, is that still feeling okay? And everything seems to be working and no parts are breaking off. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's important. So, any questions, or does anyone have any of their favorite um, emergency um, gear that they like to take that you can share with the group? All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so wax for your skins, that's really important, especially as it gets warmer in the springtime. Your skins will start clumping up, getting all wet and, and snowy, and make it so you, it's kind of like Frankenfoot, you can barely move. So having skin wax, that's, that's a really good thing to have. David? Yeah, a scraper when you're out skiing. I always have a scraper in my pocket, it's true. Yep. What's that? Super glue, yeah, some, some glue would definitely help. Glue, tape, wire, all those things. But just, you know, put a little um, repair kit together and, you know, then it just stays in your pack and, and you always have it. So, yeah, a few little things. All right. One thing I would add, I like to carry, uh, uh, what are they called, glow sticks. Glow sticks. Yeah, yeah it's fun if you don't make it to the hut, right, and you're sleeping in a cave in the snow. You have a glow stick, make it a little bit more fun. But... <laughs> Or if you're at the hut, it makes it a lot of fun also, right? It's a multi-purpose tool. But a little more seriously, it's also great uh, from experience. Often accidents happen late in the afternoon as it's getting dark. And when we're coming to find you, if you can hang a glow stick out, it makes it a lot easier for us to see you. Especially if we're like searching from the air or something, it can be really hard to see people. And often the pilots might be flying with night vision goggles. And if you shine your headlight right up at them, that's going to blind them. So you can just hang a glow stick out, and that's going to uh, help us find you, and it'll also help you party in the snow. <laughs> All right, in the let's... Back, um, wait, wait, one more. Uh, fire starter. Fire starter. Oh, yeah, that's on my list. I forgot it. So, um, yeah, at a minimum, at least a big lighter, okay? But it wouldn't hurt to have a little uh, container of like dryer lint soaked in Vaseline or something that would get the fire going really good. There's, you know, all kinds of different great fire starter kits that you can get, you know, at our local stores, the U Mountaineer and others. Um, so um, bike tubes. You just cut a little piece of a bike tube. Yeah. It'll burn slow. It's like It'll a candle. Burn slow and then get. Burn the slow and dirty. Yeah. <laughs> it just smells nice. All right, thank All right, you. Good. All right, we're gonna transition.
Uh, we'll bring up Ryan. Thank you very much, Debbie. Okay, thanks everyone. I'm Brian. Thanks for having me. So I just wanted to do a little bit of a run through of kind of current conditions, like where we're sitting right now in terms of avalanche conditions, and tell the story of how we got here. And so our story for the Aspen forecast zone, which we're all in, started in October. Um, we had a lot of early season October snowfall, which favored actually kind of the upper Roaring Fork and into the west side of the Swatch, so up into the Frying Pan, Root Eye, Woody Creek, which is a little unusual. Um, we tend to get more snow up the Crystal River Valley. Um, and eventually, it's already taken over and we'll get more, it's already got more snow back there now. But that's not what necessarily happened in October. So that's gonna play itself out in a few different ways that we'll go through now. So I wanted to pick a few different kind of just representative snow tell sites to show you what's going on. This is the Independence Pass snow tell site, which is up towards the pass, as the name would suggest. This curve on the left is uh, snow water equivalent. So one way we can kind of measure snowpack and normalize for different snowpack density is to just talk about snow in terms of inches of water. So in other words, if you took the snowpack and just melted it, how many inches of water would you have? And then so that can account for all different kinds of storm densities. A foot of super fluffy snow is not as much water as a foot of really dense heavy snow. So we often talk about snowpack in terms of snow water equivalent. And so that, was, that red line is what snow water equivalent looks like on our average, our median long-term average year. So you can see that that red graph rises and then it peaks sometime usually in mid-April and then it melts and we're back down to zero in, in, in June or July. The gray line is just accumulated precipitation over the course of the year. And so then down in here, can you guys see the cursor? Yeah. Okay, so down in here, is our current snowpack. So you can see this short little bump here, and we, got a, we were above average. We had a really snowy October. This was great news for the ski areas. It was cold, it laid a good base down, it was pretty dense snow, and it stuck around. This was terrible news for backcountry avalanche conditions, and I'll talk about why that was in a second. So here is just looking from October, through today, I put this graph up today. And so you can see this is inches of water on the ground. And right now we've got about five inches of water. And I'll show you what that means in terms of snowpack depth in a minute. And so you can see here, around the 10th of October, we started to get some pretty heavy snowfall and we bumped up. This is what's put, a, put us above average. And then we got a bunch of snowfall in early November. So this is what really helped the scary is get going, open early, the whole thing. And then this is our big dry spell in November, that big flat line, until our Thanksgiving storm, which ticks this red line up here. And then we just got recent snowfall, which is just winding down now, another weak storm system moving through this weekend. So the important parts of this is we got early season snow, and we had two dry spells. Dry spells are not good for avalanche conditions. So if we just had consistent, continual snowfall, the only avalanches we'd ever be worried about is stuff happening in the storm snow. And those are much easier to deal with, they're much easier to predict, they're much easier to manage in the terrain. When we get breaks in snow, like what we've highlighted here in the blue, those form weak layers, namely persistent weak layers, and those things behave in really nefarious ways. And we'll show you what these, uh, what these have done so far this season. If we go to Ivanhoe, so this is uh, up in the, in the Swatch, up in the frying pan area, we've got the same pattern. So you can again see here, we, went up, we peaked um, above average in early October, and now we're still a little bit above average in this drier part of our zone here. But again, we have the same two dry spells. Really similar pattern, again, topping out at about five inches of snow water equivalent on the ground as of today. And then Scofield Pass, so this is in the snowiest part of our zone, in fact, one of the snowiest parts of the state. And you can see here, we got a October snow, but as you can see on this graph on the right, we did not get much at all that stuck around from that early October snowfall. So this is unusual um, for that area. 
so that's good news for that area because it didn't have snow to sit around and get weak. We did get snow in October, second week of October, and that did get weak, but it's not as pronounced. So in other words, we had 10 to 12 days less snowpack sitting on the ground in the snowier part of the zone. So we sat below average, but realize average for this time of the year back at Schofield Pass is almost 10 inches of water as opposed to five in these drier parts of our forecast zone. So we're below average in Schofield, but we still have six and a half inches of water on the ground. So there's still more snow there. And we still did get our November dry spell. Okay, so this created weak layers like this. And so when we talk about, when you guys hear the term faceted snow or persistent weak layers, when you let snow sit out in cold, clear, dry weather, it changes and it gets weak. It gets bigger, the grains get bigger, they get more angular and sharper. And so that's why they're called facets, just because they have edges and corners to them, like a diamond is a facet. And so when this stuff is sitting anywhere in your snowpack, it's really problematic. These are what we talk about in the forecast as weak layers. This is what avalanches break on. They're persistent weak layers, which means they stick around. They don't go away very rapidly. And they behave in really hard to predict ways, and they do really funky and dangerous things. And that is now what's sitting at the bottom of our snowpack because of those dry spells. So this is a terrible foundation to build a, the rest of our snowpack on top of. You wouldn't build this building and put your weakest material at the foundation. But that's how we're building our snowpack so far this year. So we knew this was going to be a problem. We had a ton of weak snow that was sitting on the ground. And we're like, huh, this is not awesome. As soon as we put snow on top of this really weak foundation, we're going to see avalanche activity. And we did. So this is the, uh, our three snowpack graphs. So you can just look at the green are the snow water equivalent numbers. Uh, we, you'd have to put a decimal in the middle there. So like this says 46, it's just 4.6. They all have the same pattern. So we're sitting at around two feet of snow on the ground in all of these places. And down here is avalanche activity. So you can see I've got, this is above tree line, near tree line, below tree line. And then these roses just show you where on the compass, so what aspects were we seeing avalanche activity and how many. And you can see we got avalanche activity to spike during our storm events, right? Not surprising. So this is what happened. We got snow uh, after our dry spell ended around the 20th of October, and then we saw a corresponding uptick in avalanche activity, and then our Thanksgiving storm. So you can see the snowpack depth ticks up at all of these sites, and we got a bunch of avalanche activity, and those black little wedges is where we're seeing a lot of avalanche activity. So these are slopes that face north and east. Our first avalanche of the season, I think this may have been, so certainly the first avalanche of the season in this zone, and I think it may have been the first avalanche of the season that we had reported statewide, and this is our highway forecaster going up there when uh, we were wrestling with CDOT about what we were going to do with Independence Pass, and eventually uh, we shut it down uh, not too far after this. But we saw our first kind of natural avalanche breaking on these weak layers near the ground. So first loading event produced avalanches. This is what the snowpack looked like on a northeast facing slope at 11,000 feet up on Marble Peak. So this is near that Schofield site. Whoop. So we have small facets near the ground. Those small facets, or the really weak snow, are much bigger facets up near the ski areas here, like Richmond Ridge, um, and up in the frying pan and uh, the western side of the Swatch. Because it had more snow in October, and it had more time sitting out there in those dry periods. So that weak layer on the ground is worse up the Roaring Fork and up the frying pan. This is what it looked like in marble. So we have small facets on the ground, there's our late season October snow. During that dry spell, sunnier slopes or anywhere that got sun had crusts. When you have crusts in the snowpack, you often get facets that form right around those things. So it's a really problematic weak layer combination for us, or these crust facet combinations. And then we got October snow on top of it. So not an awesome snowpack. 
And then this was our local backcountry forecaster, Matt, on November 21st going up there. And this is right on the, in this same area. And did this intentionally. And this is exactly what we're warning people about. So Matt's been in snow safety for decades. Um, I wouldn't go around ski cutting stuff. Um, unless you really know what you're doing, but this is a really good video because it illustrates the kind of avalanche that we're talking about. So this is avalanches breaking on those facets near the ground. And now we're getting enough, so early season when this stuff was going, we were seeing a ton of avalanche activity, but most of it was really small. We didn't have much volume on the ground, and so people were walking away, getting shoved around. We now have enough snow on the ground where we are starting to bury people. Statewide in the last seven or eight days, we've had seven people caught and partially buried. Some of them critically, heads buried, hands sticking out of the snow. One today, just over the hill in the old uh, mining site of Pittsburgh, north of Crested Butte. We haven't had any in this zone yet, but we've had them all around the state. So this is looking up at that crown. Here's looking aside at that avalanche mat triggered, and these are really clear indications of unstable snow. So when you get whoomping sounds, when you see shooting cracks in the snowpack, these are slopes that are just waiting to avalanche, and if this slope in this bottom picture was on something steeper, steeper than about 30 degrees, it would have enough, uh, enough drive to get going and produce an avalanche. Again, uh, that November 20th storm produced more avalanches. Here's a good one in East Snowmass Creek. We also had a bunch of avalanches that ran right off here in Richmond Ridge and above the Five Fingers. This is uh, again in Marble, so this is out near Schofield, but this ran naturally. Again, another northeast facing slope. So these north and east facing slopes became the most dangerous because on lower elevation slopes and on sunny slopes, the October snow largely melted away. And we got to start over with our November snowfall. On cold, high elevation, shady slopes, north and east, the old October snow did not melt away. It turned into those large faceted grains or junk, right? And so now those are the most dangerous slopes. So you'll see a pattern, a spatial pattern. And this is what we try to warn you about in the forecast. So this is a snow profile that uh, Greg dug out on Richmond Ridge, and this corresponded to a large, rumbling, woofing collapse right near the Thanksgiving storm. And here's what our snowpack structure was looked like. We have all this depth ore, those big, large, faceted grains on the ground, and then in that little dry period between the 20th and Thanksgiving, we started to develop another layer, really problematic weak layer called surface ore, and those are those really pretty feathery crystals that sometimes form on the snow surface. They form frequently around here. They often go away because the sun beats them down or the wind destroys them. But if you get surface ore to form while it's standing up and looking really pretty on the surface and then gets preserved and buried with snow, it acts as a really bad weak layer. And now we've got one or even two weak layers in the top foot, foot and a half of our snowpack on top of all this junk near the ground. So we had uh, lots of natural activity with this Thanksgiving score, uh, storm, Richmond Ridge, multiple, so D2s, these are avalanches that are big enough to bury or kill or injure a person. So we talk about avalanches in terms of its destructive scale, that's what D stands for. So D1s are relatively harmless to people, unless you get shoved off a cliff or something like that. D2s are when we're starting to see like, these are big enough to bury or injure a person. And this is what we've seen in the last eight days. Uh, so here's an avalanche that ran during that cycle just up in Yule Creek. This was a remotely triggered avalanche that happened again outside of uh, Scofield Pass. So here is the, the crown that ran. Uh, this is looking at it closely. And the, when we talk about remote triggering, this is what persistent weak layers do. So when you hear rumbling collapses, or remote means I'm triggering an avalanche from a, a distance. So I can get a collapse underneath where I'm standing on all that weak snow, that collapse can then propagate over quite some distance, and the avalanche can pull sometimes hundreds of feet away. And that's what happened in this, right? So this is why these things are, 
really hard to manage in the field. Like you don't know like how they're gonna break across the terrain features. They can often cross ridge lines, things, terrain features that you might think can find an avalanche, these things ignore. So persistent weak layers just require super conservative uh, route finding and big buffers around steep avalanche terrain because you just do not know how they're gonna fail. You can trigger them from the flats, you can trigger them from below, and there's numerous cases of people getting buried and killed in avalanches from flat ground then they triggered the slope above them. And it's during these kinds of conditions. So these are really obvious signs of instability. If you're feeling woomphing and seeing cracks shoot out from your feet, 10, 50, 100 feet, these are signs of very, very unstable snow. And you need to stick to lower angle terrain. Uh, we got this report just two days ago. So this is uh, the, the practice slope, which sits just above the Taggart and Green Wilson huts. It's where people practice triggering avalanches. This is where we have, we have this observation around this time of the year almost every year. It's like uncanny. And we had it again this year. And so here's what this one looked like. And then multiple naturals in Express Creek, just from the recent loading event. This is uh, right outside the Markley hut. This is the same slope that um, caught and killed a person from this valley last year in the middle of January. So this slope ran naturally just from the Thanksgiving loading event. Again, and below tree line, but a northeast facing slope. And then finally yesterday, so this is Harris's off Richmond Ridge, big avalanche, and this one broke a foot down on this buried surface or layer and then stepped down to the ground, into the depth or the weak facets near the ground. So this is now what we're dealing with. There are avalanches that could break and they're easier to trigger when the weak layers are closer to the surface. So they could break on these weak layers closer to the surface and then step down into deeper weak layers and then of course entrain much more volume of snow and get big enough to bury somebody. This is what we're warning about in the forecast. So here's a summary of avalanche activity. These are roses. And so if you look at a rose like this, that inner circle is above tree line, that middle circle is near tree line, and that lower circle is below tree line. These are just different triggers. Some of them run naturally. They're just triggered by the weather events and loading events themselves. Some of them are triggered by people, and then some of them are triggered by explosives. But you can see the pattern here is that the vast majority of these things are running on north and east facing slopes for all the reasons we just mentioned. And so this is why our forecast looks the way it does. So we're at considerable, which means essentially av this is level three out of a five tier scale. And considerable means aval natural avalanche activity is possible, which we've seen. We're seeing avalanches run all by itself. And human triggered avalanches, you triggering an avalanche is likely on steep slopes if you go to these aspects that are shaded in gray. So where it's a persistent slab avalanche, you're likely to trigger them on slopes steeper than about 30 degrees in that graded shea area. And they're gonna be small, D1, to D2. And when everything starts to large, so whenever you start to see the avalanches that are large or bigger than that, these are big enough to kill you. So we need to start planning accordingly, giving ourselves a wide buffer around the terrain features. And persistent slabs, whoops, like we said, because they fail in these really hard to predict ways, require big buffers. So if you're traveling in the backcountry, I'm sure Greg will go over this on January 18th, you need to give steep slopes a really wide buffer because you just don't know how they're gonna fail. And it, people who have been dealing with these for years will pr treat this with a lot of caution because uh, you don't get better at predicting how persistent slab avalanches are gonna fail with years of experience. You get smarter and you stay farther away. That's, that's, that's what happens. This is just a cool shot. When we finally, so we had to close Red Mountain Pass last year for 18 days during the big March avalanche cycle. When we finally opened it, uh, this is what US Hi Highway 550 looked like over Red Mountain Pass. Um, I was gonna quickly show, Greg, can you get me on the internet? Everyone familiar with our website? 
Okay. We also have a phone app out now. We've had for a couple years. The phone app's been updated. You can now submit observations directly to us through the phone app. So you can take pictures, hit submit. It'll be geotagged. Please tell us what you're seeing. We can't be everywhere. You guys are out and about. If you see stuff, tell us. It doesn't even have to be avalanches. If you get woomping, cracking, if you see nothing, tell us. That often helps. Um, so this is what the homepage looks like. That's us here in the Aspen Zone. That's what the forecast will look like. You get a brief summary, and then a more deep dive into current conditions for the central mountains. So it'll be a central mountain discussion, which will cover the Sawatch through Crested Butte uh, and the Gunnison Zone through the Aspen Zone, if you want to dig a little bit further. We also have um, a pretty robust weather station page. So if you come into the Aspen Zone, you can find a ton of information. The ski areas um, share a lot of their weather station data publicly with us. You can click on, like here's Schofield, you can click on the station, you'll get graphical displays. As well as the data tables. So you can see like here in just this last storm we've gotten an inch or more of water in Schofield Pass in the last 24 hours. That's a good foot of snow back there. And as Greg mentioned, uh, you can find our accidents right here, and we'll do write-ups on these things. So if we have enough information to do some kind of report, we'll put out an accident report. We've got a, at least one or two up now. Uh, so we got one up now, so this was a backcountry skier that was killed uh, outside of a hut uh, near Copper. And then we're working on a few more. So we've had partial burials, like I said, in Pittsburgh, we've had partial, this was near Janet's cabin. Um, we've had partial burials, there's like seven of them. And so as you can, when we get these things posted on our homepage, we'll post it in the news section. So here's the Vail Pass Avalanche Report. And you can see just in the last week, and this is something I just noticed yesterday and put this up, but from November 25th through the Thanksgiving storm, we recorded 185 avalanches, 75 of which were big enough to bury or kill a person. We had six people partially buried in the last week. That is now seven with the new one from Pittsburgh. So we started off with a really crappy, junky snowpack. It's gonna be living with us for quite some time. So it's just gonna take a really conservative ease into the backcountry. And I think like the steep terrain, especially on these north and east facing slopes are gonna be ones I avoid for the foreseeable future. Anything else? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, it can. It can do that. So like, the question was, if you trigger an avalanche, will it like, essentially wipe out the weak layers? Sometimes that's our best bet, is we want a big natural avalanche cycle and hopefully start over. But we've got like, so that may happen with like the surface war. Once surface war does its thing, it doesn't, you can't really reload it. It usually goes away. The stuff near the ground, you know, when we've got this much of that junk snow sitting on the ground, it, these avalanches usually leave stuff behind. And so some of the stuff off Richmond, I was talking to, I think, Greg and Deb, but has already run, been reloaded, and run again. And that's really common with that much depth war near the ground. So the surface war will kind of just get destroyed in the event, but depth war will not. Yeah. Uh, we don't do rescues very often. We sometimes will work with these guys and do like, you know, re help rescue teams respond to them. If it's kind of more, if we're involved, it means someone's been killed, generally. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, we do recoveries, not so much rescues, and we do post-mortem reports. Yeah, so you guys have an awesome mountain rescue team here. Um, they do the rescues, and if we can help, we do. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of people, if they're rescued from an avalanche where they've been buried, 
it's their companions that dig them out because you just don't have that much time. Um, there, there's an increasing chance of being found by outside operations, particularly things like RECO and pretty quick response times, but your best bet if something all goes wrong is your partners to dig you out. So just to tie in, for those of you who didn't hear uh, Dr. David Swirsky's comment uh, just now about rescue, so this avalanche workshop that we have coming on, the 36th annual, they should still sign up for, uh, that started. So he was kind of one of the initial like people who got this whole program started 36 years ago. We owe him a lot of credit. And, and it started because of an avalanche accident where there was an avalanche where the group left to go get help. And so that's not how that's solved. And so that's where we decided we need to start doing some more public education and start these events. And it's kind of snowballed and there's been iterations since then. And so that's kind of what that workshop's all about. It's a full day practice, hands-on skill training on companion rescue. Anyways, thank you very much, Brian. That was awesome, really appreciate it. Uh, now that we have a little update on conditions, I'm a little nervous about the tour plan I showed you guys. We'll probably do something else. We'll probably do that other idea we were talking about. Sworn to secrecy, I wasn't allowed to show you any maps of that. Um, great, I'm gonna pull up Michael. Michael Kennedy now will come and talk to us about uh, some human factor issues. So, we talked a lot about, Debbie talked about some group gear and things like that. Everyone's got their own thing <clears throat> with their individual gear, and I'd just like to re-emphasize that idea of inspecting your gear before you go on a trip and making sure that it's working and that it's not broken. Because, you know, you get to the trailhead and your binding's broken, then your day is sort of ruined. So that's a, that's a good basics place to start out with. Um, but really, there is, <clears throat> we've got knowledge, we have experience, we have attitude, and we have rituals. And <clears throat> when we talk about knowledge, I think about things like um, Avalanche Report, <clears throat> you know, your own education in the backcountry. Um, these are a couple of things I pulled from Parks Canada, which is, this is a fairly simple look at terrain and how you might look at terrain. Um, I'm not gonna go over the details on that, but you can get these later, because um, we can email them out to you. Um, but it's simple, challenging, and complex terrain. Um, this is the more detailed version, which has much more uh, information in terms of specific angles and the, you know, the type of slope and things like that. And these, these are very important things to be thinking about. Um, This is something that is a very is a fairly simple um, thing that I use quite a bit now. It's called Alp Truth, um, and it's it's basically these different factors: avalanches in the area the last 48 hours, <clears throat> loading by winds, you know, snow, wind, or rain in the last 48 hours, the path that you can see the avalanche path, the terrain traps, gullies, trees, cliffs, or other features the avalanche bulletin rating, unstable snow, and we just were talking about that, collapsing, cracking, hollow snow, or other clear evidence of instability, um, and then thaw instability, which is changing temperatures. And basically, this is a really quick checklist, and if, if you've got two or three of these factors are happening, then you wanna be really careful, okay? So that's, that's a good, simple way of, of looking at that that sort of thing. Um, when we talk about personal experience, we have our own skills, we have our own expertise, whether it's first aid, whether, um, you know, just our experience in the mountains and things like that. And one of the biggest things is to have that sense of comfort in that mountain environment, which you only gain from being out there. Um, and so I'd encourage you to take it slow and 
um, and you know, learn as you go along. So there's some really important, um, we talk about heuristics in decision making, and these are really these mental shortcuts that we use that allow us to solve problems and make judgments quickly and efficiently. And they're very helpful, you know, it's like you can, when you're driving up to a, to a yellow light, for example, and, you know, you're 50 yards away, you are fact, you're making a bunch of decisions unconsciously to decide whether to go through the yellow light or to stop. You know, it could be because of there's traffic, it could be that the road is slippery so you can't stop too quickly. Um, there's a lot of things, so that's a good example of, of how these things can really help us make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. But they can also be very, they can be real traps. And this, this chart sort of talks about some of the common things that we might encounter in the backcountry, particularly with skiing, that can be traps and can lead you in the wrong direction. And one of the, <clears throat> one of the big ones is this familiarity idea. So you've skied a slope, like there's slopes I've skied in marble probably 300 times in the last 10 years. And so I'm gonna, th you know, it's a natural thing for me to think, well, I know what this slope is about and I know when it's gonna slide. And, but you really have to check that. You have to check each and every time you go out there to make your, sure you're not falling into that trap. Um, and these other ones, authority, that's basically following expert opinion or someone that, that you think knows more than you. Um, so these are all things to be, to be very careful of because they can lead you, um, they can basically lead you into making bad decisions and decisions where you haven't really looked at what's right in front of you. Deb talked a little bit earlier <clears throat> about this communication idea, and I think that's super important in the backcountry, is having this clear, consistent communication within your group. And one part of that is you make a plan, and the other part of it is that you check in fairly frequently um, with your group, how everyone's doing, and that you make conscious decisions, that you don't just strip your skins off and then head down the slope. But you check in, you make, a, you, know, you make a mini plan for that particular slope, for example. Like, who's gonna go first? You know, who's gonna bring up the rear? Where are you gonna ski to and regroup? How are you gonna keep track of each other? Um, these are all really important things, I think, to consider as you're, as you're you know, working with your group out in the back country. Um, I'll say a few words about <clears throat> group size. Um, to me, for backcountry skiing, three to four is really ideal. If you get much bigger than that, then it tends to be, you know, two people are talking over here and two people are talking over here, and it's very hard to keep that group together. Um, so, from my perspective at least, keeping the group smaller, keeping the group you know, people should have sort of a similar risk tolerance. I think it's helpful to have a similar level of experience and uh, knowledge so that, um, so that you can all sort of agree on, on a plan and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, and I think you really need to listen to, uh, you really need to slow down, as I'm saying here, slow down and pay attention. In other words, as you're skiing along on your, you know, on your hike up to the peak or something, you should be watching, you should be looking for those signs, listening for a collapsing, looking at, at uh, you know, evidence of avalanches coming around, feeling the snow, reaching down and doing a quick, you know, just dig with your hand a little bit as you stop. You know, see what's happening with that surface, dig down a little bit, see if there's some weak layer that's in that first foot or so. Um, how does it feel with your ski pole as you put your ski pole through that snowpack? You can feel some of those layers that Brian was talking about just, just as you're skiing along. So you want to be observing pretty constantly.
I think it, for me at least, um, in avalanche training, you do want to ski one at a time. Um, I tend to encourage people to ski conservatively in the backcountry um, because of the fact that you can, if you do get injured, it's going to be bad and you're going to have to, you're going to have to survive until you can, you know, get back to your car or get rescued or something. Um, and sometimes, you know, we tend to get, you know, a little overexcited and you want to ski fast, but you got to remember that if you hit a rock or hit a stump and you break your leg, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a serious situation. Um, you know, I think you have to have a little bit of a mentality. And, and Rich mentioned it earlier. I mean, when you ski out of the ski area, you are in the back country. And uh, it's like a straight line. There's no, it's like a binary sort of thing. And so I think you really need to have that attitude. And there is, there is no side country. The side country is not any safer than the backcountry. In fact, it can be more dangerous because we don't treat it as seriously. And I think we saw that in some of those um, avalanche statistics, accident statistics. Um, I think you recognize that there's no rescue except the rescue that you're going to perform for yourself. Um, mountain rescue is going to be helpful, but particularly when it comes to an avalanche, they're not going to get there quick enough. Um, and so you're going to have to have, within your party, you're going to have to have the skills to get somebody out. Um, in, a lot of way, in a lot of ways, I think you have to look at a, an avalanche beacon as a, basically a body recovery device. Um, and again, dial it back a bit. Uh, so I think there's some, there's some little rituals that I like to, to use in the backcountry. And one of them is this idea of you have a run list or you have a, you have a plan, you have an idea of what you're going to do. And that there's basically th three different parts of that. One is that you're, you're really darn sure that you can go on this particular slope without much problem. Um, you're not going to be caught in an avalanche because it's lower angle uh, and that sort of thing. So you'll have that sort of as one option. There's going to be a big area that you really don't know until you get out there. You're going to have some ideas because of the history of the slope, the, the forecast, um, your previous experience, what you know about a particular you know, slope and how you've planned it. But you're going to have to make a decision when you get out there. And then I think it's pretty important to also have <clears throat> within that list is basically the no-go zone, which is we're just not going to go there because you know, because it's a 40 degree slope in January in Colorado with two feet of depth or. Um, and <clears throat> that's important because sometimes you'll get out there and you go, oh, things are way better than I thought they were going to be. The s snow seems way more solid. I see a set of tracks on a similar slope over here that someone's put in. That's the time, I think, to really sort of check yourself and avoid those kind of things because that's where I think you can really get into some trouble when you get in the backcountry. Um, luck is not a good survival strategy. I think that goes without saying. And a lot of times, I mean, I've relied on luck uh, over the years, and, uh, and I've been lucky, but I think you have to recognize that that's not a way to survive for long periods of time. If you're going to make a big decision, in other words, if you're in one of those sort of those gray zones where you're not quite sure if it's right or not, it's really good to stop. And I like to stop and eat and think about it a little bit before you make a big decision like that. And then last but not least, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's really good to, to uh, spend some time you know, looking at how the day went, and especially on the days that go really, really well. I mean, if you go out and you, and you have some problem, you cut a little slough loose, somebody gets maybe, you know, falls down or gets partially buried, you know that you're gonna, you're gonna sit and analyze that and figure out what went wrong. <clears throat> but I think it's very valuable to, you know, even on the best days, 
to really ask this kind of question. Did we get it done or did we get away with it? Really look very closely at how you could have done better on that particular day. Were there any places where the communication wasn't good? Was there any place where someone felt uncomfortable but didn't, wasn't able to express that? Um, were there times when you skimmed over a rock uh, that if you had just been pressing that much harder on your ski, it would have, you know, knocked you down and broken your leg or something? Really, even on the, on the good days, try to uh, really look closely at how you can better uh, do things in the future. And that's it.